after my three straight weeks of travel, I'm on vacation. Just for a couple days, but enough to begin feeling like a human being again, as opposed to a smile attached to a hand for shaking. It's strange how travel, especially task-related travel, work travel, can feel like it separates the parts of you and flings them around. Whatever continuous thing I normally am begins to feel like a constellation of things in orbit, each part with its own path and gravity, like some kind of me orrery, a disembodied whole body. I'm having a hard time explaining this. I feel like this is the kind of thing that I would draw or paint if I knew how to do those things. I suspect that I've witnessed this idea communicated in dance, I just I didn't recognize it when it was happening in front of me. Anyway, I'm on vacation. I came to the beach, Cape Cod specifically, a fact which probably feels a bit belabored if you follow me on Snapchat. Sorry. I grew up coming here, and it's not quite the same Cape that I remember. It feels more crowded, more commercialized, but that's sort of in keeping with the rest of, uh, well, everything. Still, there is something vacation-y about the beach in light of all that even if you have to almost literally fight to find an empty spot on one. Summer beaches are a mess. They're like the security lines at major airports. All kinds and types of people, some of whom know exactly what they're doing and some of whom seem like they never thought about the situation they're in before they arrived. Dumbstruck and underprepared, barely capable managing their effects. The major difference being that the beach is supposed to be fun, so it doesn't matter. The security line at an airport, on the other hand, is some kind of bizarre stress test for the limits of human decency and self-respect. If the gladiator games were to ever return, they could involve x-ray machines, plastic bins, and a man shouting about how you must have nothing in your pockets nothing people literally not a thing and then a guy goes through the machine with a pocket full of change and the emperor sitting atop a throne constructed from the belts and shoes of the fallen gives him a thumbs up the crowd roars right vacation the beach what i have started thinking is that while some people do most people don't go to the beach or the beach, the sandy part upon which you put your squat chair and read your book. If you're over the age of 12, the sandy part is really just hassle. Hard to walk in, gets in all your stuff, and so on. If we could reach into the nether regions of every beach biome and reliably replace sand with nice, soft grass, I think a good number of us, those of us who don't want to build sand castles at least, would be into it? Maybe I'm wrong? I don't know. Either way, neither I nor most of the beach combers I know go to the beach for the sand. They go to the beach for the ocean. The beach is a symptom of the ocean. The draw of the ocean is powerful enough that you can, it seems, recreate the conditions of a crowded, hot New York City subway car on something resembling what Hollywood would have you believe is the surface of Mars, and people will still call it relaxing. That's some powerful stuff. Think about it. You go to the beach. Which way do you face? Towards the ocean. If you're trying to get a tan, maybe you face the sun. If facing the sun isn't also facing the ocean. But that's a choice. The natural inclination is you go to the beach, you sit facing the ocean. There's just, there's something about it. And why is that? Well, I read some accounts by some people who are both neuroscientists and surfers, psychologists and amateur fishermen, etc., etc., trying to explain it. Why it is that the ocean has this effect on people. They talked about the concentrations of salt water in the human body, about how our brains float in salt water. And so being in or near the salt water, our body just knows. There's some precognitive process that ascertains we're in some supportive and home-like environment. So it feels restorative, centering. 
It pulls all of your spinning off bits in from orbit. I feel about this type of your body just knows reasoning the same way I do when dance music aficionados wax endlessly poetic about how 120 beats per minute, the standard dance music tempo, is the same BPM of the human heart. It's not technically, but whatever. Dance music is such a release, they say, because your body knows. You can't help it. The music just gets inside you. Which is not to say it's not true. Entrainment is a thing. We've talked about it several times here on Reasonably Sound. Unconscious physical processes tend to sync up with certain rhythmic environmental information, but I've never heard someone in baggy pants and lots of bracelets go, oh, yeah, well, so. Entrainment, it's this thing where, with dance music, it's this desire to make things more mystical than they actually are or have to be. The thing itself is already abstract or ephemeral, and so it feels forgivable or necessary or maybe even just thematic to stay in the world of abstraction. It seems like it's the same with the ocean. No shortage of endless romancing and mysticism is awarded to the briny depths. The ocean floor is arguably a more likely candidate for the final frontier than space. It is, as far as our understanding goes, the ideal of unknown, other, elsewhere. So, when asked why it is the ocean draws and calms us so, we wade directly into mumbo-jumbo territory. Which, I mean, hey, don't mind if I do. I think the main reason the ocean has such a draw is that it doesn't give a shit. How's that for mystical? The ocean doesn't give a shit about you or your problems. It doesn't care about your rent, relationships, work deadlines, or mean people on the internet. And it is huge as hell. If you're at the right beach, you can stand in front of something that not only fills the entirety of your periphery and from your feet to forever out in front of you, but also doesn't give a damn about you one bit. To quote Herman Melville, the ocean is dispassionate as fuck. The ocean is also boring. Sorry, marine biologists and deep sea divers, but hear me out. Visually, cognitively, looking at it from the shore, it's boring. Not a lot going on. The ocean is boring in the way fields of grain are boring, but those usually don't stretch out to the horizon. Maybe it's boring in the way an impossibly large book is boring. An infinite, eternal landscape of knowledge comprised of so many units of discrete things which together create one striking and disquieting monolith. You stand in front of it, intending to make it your subject, but it makes you its own. Sit down and shut up, says the ocean. I got stuff going on. The ocean is, as long as some guy with a boombox isn't on the beach with you, or you're not currently trudging through thickets of gross, slimy seaweed, serene. And serene is another word for boring. Serene should maybe also be another word for simple because you have no clue at all whatsoever what's going on below the surface. Is the ocean serene? No. Is the ocean serene to the guy in the flip-flops who snuck a six-pack and his dog onto the beach? Yes. Also, the ocean is boring in a way that's different from how the Grand Canyon is boring. The Grand Canyon is massive and fills the horizon and doesn't give two shits about you, but the Grand Canyon is also a show-off. You go to the Grand Canyon and you feel insignificant, not unimportant. That's a meaningful difference. The Grand Canyon is an amazing sight to behold, which reminds one of the impossible beauty and scale of nature. There is an infinity of things to look at and into and notice, or if you're that kind of person, photograph when you're at the Grand Canyon. Staring into the Grand Canyon, we're reminded that our bills and relatives don't matter because, oh good lord, nothing we do matters. Look at this massive hole in the ground. The ocean, on the other hand, to people sitting on the beach, facing it, because hey, that's what you do, it's flat. And water. With some waves. And the waves make that sound. If I had to guess, being neither a neuroscientist nor a surfer, even a little bit, I would guess that entrainment must factor at least a little 
The rhythm of the ocean waves crashing isn't quite at dance music pace, but it's a good one, and steady. When the tide is right, the sound of the waves can ride that same line that Muzak does, the one between protesting too much and wanting, waiting to be noticed. Too much wave crashing is dramatic, not enough destroys the rhythm of the place, a rhythm which is not strictly regular, but still unsurprising, stable if not fixed. Like the tides themselves, which come in or out an hour or so later every day, creating the revolving, semi-regular wane and wax of the shoreline, even if the periods are not perfect, they are predictable. What is it about the sound of water? The sound of streams babbling or rain on the window, a waterfall or waves crashing. There is some freeing fluidity to these sounds for maybe that very reason that they are both free and fluid. Some provide what's called masking. The sound they make, mostly akin to white noise, masks or blocks other sounds also being made. In the case of a waterfall, the only thing you hear when you're near it, probably, is the waterfall. There have been studies done, I read about one in the UK and one in Chicago, about the relative pleasantness of urban areas with high automobile traffic which also have water features. The water features, quote, such as fountains, streams, water sculptures, or waterfalls, end quote, were found to generally increase the, quote, subjective pleasantness end quote, of these areas due to the masking effects that they had on traffic noise. Sources for these things at infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound, by the way. It makes total sense. This is why people sleep with white noise generators on, and one of the reasons why offices with tall ceilings and no carpets might tend to keep the HVAC running even though it's already frigid. When you can hear everything, the world is maddening. People, as it turns out, tend to become more stressed and less motivated while working if they have to constantly listen to their coworkers chit-chat about nonsense. White noise generators in the office or loud humming ductwork diminishes the presence of Kathy's irritating laugh and constant stories about her cat Pickles while she's hanging around the vending machine, which just happens to be like five feet from your desk. It's either that or wear your headphones all day, and that's just... I mean, that's a whole other can of worms, right? Like, what's the etiquette there? Someone's wearing headphones, and you need to ask them for something, but headphones are really, they're kind of like the do not disturb sign hung on the hotel doorknob that is the listener's ears, but I mean, they are at work, so... Okay, all right, another time, another time. So, but there's white noise, but you're not at your desk. You're on your towel at the beach, facing the ocean, trying to unkilter all of your off-kiltered many parts. The white noise is the waves. They're crashing... And maybe this is why it's so easy, or comparatively easy, to hold in our heads the contradiction that is crowded beach and relaxing day at the beach. In the case of a wave, for a brief moment during its crash, other sonic information may get covered. And maybe it's part of why the center of the beach is always the most crowded. Okay, let's, no, let's be honest. The center of the beach is always the most crowded because that's where they put the parking lot, and boy, people hate walking, especially with all of the chairs and umbrellas and coolers that are required for going to the beach. But maybe another part of it is that being at the center of the beach gives you a good, even ocean vista, but also a great stereo experience. The waves occurring on either side of you and masking the mythic hydra of children's voices and lovers' quarrels, no matter where they come from. The white noise sound enveloping whatever else there is, at least during the moments when the waves are crashing. The crash and boom or thunder, as my uncle called it this weekend, of the waves isn't like the hum of the AC or the white noise machine. It happens, like we talked about, in time, in a rhythm. Unlike droning white noise produced mechanically on the beach, there are points of less or no noise. No crashing, just beach ambiance. If the tide is coming in and the waves are crashing, there'll be just enough sound coming through the masking effect of the waves to keep track of the greater details of the gossip being traded around you. 
allowing you to catch bits and pieces of how the other families relate to one another. And what kind of ice cream, exactly, the kids behind you intend on purchasing when the truck comes by. In more ways than one, maybe the ocean is interesting not just because of what it is, but what it obscures. Compare, weirdly, to the conch shell that you can hold up to your ear and say, Oh, you can hear the ocean! Really what you're hearing is a resonant filter, the ambient noise from around wherever you happen to be passing into the small and enclosed space of the shell, which, depending upon its size, shape, and material, attenuates or emphasizes certain frequencies in a way that resembles the white noise of waves constantly crashing. But because the ocean is so mythic, and for most people so distant, it's more fun and more meaningful, more mystical, to say, when you put that shell up to your ear, it'll play, just especially for you, the sound of the ocean. The place it's from, or belongs. And maybe you can feel those in-orbit parts of you settle, just for a second, comfortable in the fact that the ocean, which doesn't care one bit about your stupid goddamn problems, is out there somewhere. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and Snapchat at Mike Rugnetta. And to quote Herman Melville, Reasonably Sound is made for the infinite guest network from American Public Media. Sand in Dad's car. Are you done recording? It's rolling, but it's it just I'm not gonna use this part, but I'm I'm just gonna let it go anyway. I'm gonna use the like when we get out of the car. That is a very sensibly crowded beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There were more people there yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Beach, Mon- Beach Monday, big deal maybe? Oh, maybe a little choppier today, I don't know. The water is so warm in that. Oh, really? Oh my gosh, wow. It's so warm. It looks like it has. Does does this beach have seaweed? Yeah, I mean, you can see that they. Um, 
It's like a little brown. They had come through with um, this like little tractor. You see all of the... Oh, is that what that was? Yeah, because the oh. they, they clean it up off the beach. Um, but this, that's one of the reasons why I don't like to come here. It's notorious for seaweed. Oh, I see. Yeah.